Oh, hey, we pray that you're in church today. Somewhere, all right, your heart is there if you're not there physically, uh, because we're in the end days. And in these last days, the enemy is throwing out all that he has because he understands that there's a time appointed for the total elimination of his presence from God's people. And so we pray this morning that your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ becomes more than it ever has in the past. Because one day, maybe today, we'll hear a glorious sound. And all of us who have ears to hear, we'll hear. Because we're expecting his return. And I pray with all my heart, you that's hearing this message today, that you'll totally fall in love with Jesus because he gave his life to show you that he was totally in love with you. So we welcome you this morning. Thank you for your time. We know that guess what? Everybody's celebrating 4th of July. All that's fine, but there's a greater celebration that happens within us. And that's through the salvation that our Lord Jesus has brought into our life. And the power of the Holy Spirit that resides in us to carry out that salvation every day. And we've got a daddy God. We call him our father, our beloved father. We have a father who has his hands raised over us in the day that he swore to Abraham that we would be blessed by the seed that would come forth. And his hands are still up, accepting all who will come through the name of Jesus. And so we pray today for you. I'm telling you, there's no sense in wasting any kind of time. You know, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or wherever we are, we don't have time to waste talking about what's going on wrong and what's going on this and that. We need to get you into the kingdom of Almighty God because time has already wound down. Amen. So we pray that whatever we say today, hey, listen, don't jump up and down because maybe you're not the most committed person to the Lord if you're born again. And certainly don't criticize if you're not born again. For there's a power that's residing over you and I that nothing above us, nothing beneath us, and nothing on this world can change God's love for us. You need to know that today is a day of great visitation to you by the revelation of the love of Almighty God. So we thank you again for your time. It's invested well if you spend it well. And we pray that all of you that are here with us today, we know that a lot of people are all out of town, everywhere people are, you know, it's, it's like that with church today. I talked to someone last week and they said, they had talked to some pastors and it says, all up and down, it's, it's like, you know, you got to go rope people to drag them to church now. Well, I'll tell you today, throw away your rope. Because if they're not willing to come, God's not willing to accept. God does it from a heart. He's a heart searcher. If your heart is not right, there's no need in spending all that physical time trying to physically get somebody to church. If they won't listen to the Spirit of God, they're definitely not going to listen a lot to you. So we pray today, sincerity, grip your heart. Those of you that are believers, and reach out to every person that you can, family members, friends, even your enemies, because he died for them too. For you once were an enemy. He died for them too. And so let's not ever devalue anyone because they don't celebrate with us, they don't serve with us, they don't do the same things we do. They don't eat the same stuff we eat. Hey, listen, God is God of all, and he loves all. For God so loved the world, all, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever 
That's you, me, and everyone else in this world. And so let's take today and be very serious about our life and contact with Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen and amen. amen. So won't you guys give the Lord a praise off, and I know you've been, you know, you've been doing all this today and you've been all over the place. Well, would you please take your seats, and we're going to, uh, we're going to get into the Word of God today. Uh, because some of you guys, you know, you look like you're a little tired. Some of you guys, I don't know, look like you or whatever. Uh, but the Word of God never changes. It's always standing strong, and you and I are part of that. We are God's forever family. And in this day, we really have to live as if we are God's forever family. Are you guys with us? I would this morning that you would open your Bibles up to 1 John. 1 John. Chapter 4. Today we're going to talk about the revelation of God's love to you and I. And to all of us that are born again. To everybody that's on vacation, those of you that are viewing us live stream, wherever you are, hey, listen, there's an amazing love that's available for all of us. Can you imagine the infinite number of sins that God has watched over time? Can you imagine the infinite number of sins that God has forgiven you for? And yet his love is so pure and kind and steadfast toward all of us that whenever you call upon his name, he listens. So powerful, this love. And I see in our day, church has changed since we began church many years ago. And I see so many people that say that they're Christians that seem to have some sort of a mask on their face that when they take that mask off you don't see the joy of the Lord their strength because no matter what you and I go through the Lord God has said that his love is more than enough to keep us and so in this day that you and I live in we need to really practice what we preach we really need to practice who we say we are if we say we are believers and at the beginning of the year everybody was jumping up and down because you know we we taught all those nights and days for you know about the year of the believer and this is the year of the believer and then you know then you find people ushering things out of their mouth that don't line up with you being a believer or simply making other things available for them on Sundays and don't come to church and when I say making things I'm talking about intentionally making things available for them that they don't come and worship God. How can you come to church late and say you come to worship the Lord when we know that we start at whatever time your ministry is and this ministry, and we say we have a set time, so we set that time with the Lord, and so the Lord meets us at that time. He's always early. He's never late. He's always here when you get here. And so when we come to worship him, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. We've been doing this for 30-some years, and I still see people walk in church late. Like, it's okay with God that I just show up late to your worship. It has to be because you don't know him. Because if you know him, you're going to give him the priority time of your life. And this is what makes the great difference when he says to trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land, do good, and feed on his faithfulness. And then he does certain things because we have met the conditions, the requirements of coming before him. So what you think about in your love walk with the Lord might need to be adjusted today because he's going to require an account of all of us when we stand before him one day. And that account is going to begin. He says judgment begins at the household of God. How you come before him how you present yourself. What's the priority of why you come to church? Why you live every day and why you pray? and Why do you get up and do what you do every day? What's the priority motive in that thing of why you do what you do? See, if you're doing it just because everybody else do it, you're missing out. 
But if you do it because you have a sincere love for God because you know that God loved you first. I mean, say what? He loved you first. So when did he love you? When you were a mess. Look at somebody and say, he's talking to you right now. God loved you when you were a mess. Okay? And because he loved you first, then we should understand that love that came to me when I was a mess. If he could love me then, how much love can I receive now Amen. that I'm in Christ Jesus? Amen. Are you guys with me? Amen. It says this in 1 John chapter 4. Everybody here? Beginning in verse 16. And we have known and believed that the love that, the love that God have to us, God is love, and that he that dwelleth in God dwelleth, he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. So this is where our birth came from. It's telling you this is where your origin came from. All right? God is love, and because you're in God, you are love. So you are a son or a daughter of love. Okay? Because God loves you, God, God is in you, and you are in God. You're birth of God because you're born again. You are a person of love. Okay? So if you're not presenting that as a personality, then we have to check up and find out, did you really get born again? See, it got real quiet when I said that. Because, see, some people don't check their own faith. See, you have to have faith in your faith. Not in somebody else's faith because they got born again. You have to have faith in your faith that you got born again, that you got saved. Because if you really got saved, then there's a dynamic that took place in your life that's going to present itself to everybody you meet. Not a buffet of people, but everybody that you meet. Amen. All right? Not a culture of people, but everybody that you meet. Somebody say amen. amen. See, because I'm born of God. He says this, and we have known and believed the love that God have toward us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Because he's love there, we are love here. Come on now, talk to me this morning. Because see, you're going to have to get this thing straight before you meet the Lord. Whether you walk in love by choice or whether you walk in love because that's just your character. And some people walk in love by choice. They pick who they want to love, when they want to love, how they want to love, and whatever. But the love of God is not like that. Even on the cross, Jesus said, Father... And the old traditional Greek, old traditional Jewish says this. While they were putting nails in his hands and his feet, he was saying that. He didn't just say that before he left here. It says that when they were nailing, putting the nails in his hands and in his feet, he was saying, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they're doing. And it says he kept on repeating that. Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they're doing. See, that's the kind of love that you and I need to walk in. The kind of love that looks at an offense and says, let's fix it and keep on going because we're all one family. Amen. We're all one family, you know? It, 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 well, there's not going to be a special family when you get to glory. <laughs> and you're going to have a special neighborhood because you guess what? You were, you were so special when you were there. No, no, no. None of us are special with God unless we're in God. See, when you're in Christ Jesus, then you become special because of him, but not because of you. So we're going to look at this great thing. It says this, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. In other words, when I stand before him, I'm going to say, Lord, I did my very best to replicate your life here in the life of love. Amen. In the day of judgment, all of us will stand. Amen. I did my very best, Lord. You know, they did this, they said that, they act like this, Lord, but I did my very best. I would always think about you when I made that decision. I would go, always go back to your word because you, the living word, use the written word to walk in victory. So I know that I can use the same word that you use and I can have victory every day also. So, Lord, in judgment, I stand before you. I am open, Lord God. There's nothing here. I am standing here letting you know that, guess what? What you saw was exactly what I was. I did exactly what you said do. I live by your word. So man shall live by, by your word, not by bread, but by your word. And that's what I did, Lord. And so I did that, and I, and I perfected your love as best I could. 
And he's going to say, well done. I pray that's you today. All right? Because his love is shown to us when we worship him. His love. And this is what, you know, that sometimes it can, it can agitate the spirit of the house. Because when you come in, every house, every house of prayer all over the world, we should have our eyes focused on God because he has his eyes focused on us. All right? And he tells us that no matter what you're going through, it can't separate you from my love because I got my eyes on you. No matter what the enemy is bringing against you, it can't separate you from my love. I've got my eyes on you. And you need to know I have my eyes on you. So if you have your eyes on me, you see me with my eyes on you. In other words, we meet face to face in worship. When we come to pray, we come face to face. Why? Because Jesus is mediator. He's high priest. But he, that high priest position is he's mediator between God and man. In other words, he holds up the dignity of the Trinity. But at the same time, he looks toward the sympathy that he himself had to go through being a man in a man suit. So now he looks at you and he says, listen, look at me face to face. I understand what you're going through. I understand the pain. I know about the disappointment. I know about the rejection. I know about all of that. They rejected me as a king. They rejected my kingdom that came from heaven to the earth. I understand all of that that you're going through, but look at me. Did not I become victorious because I was obedient? Did not I become victorious? Because I understood that, guess what? Truth is more important than emotion. Did not I become victorious? See, this is the power of love. And I see so many people getting caught up in the times. And yet Paul told us in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, he says, don't get caught up in the times of this world being conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. Say what? That you may prove. You can prove how much God loves you by getting in God's face, by calling God Daddy God. You can, uh, you know, our beloved Father, you can prove how much Daddy God loves you by coming to him and saying, I already know you love me because you loved me when I was a sinner. Guess what? So if I know if you love me when I was a sinner, I know you must love me so much to now because I'm in Christ Jesus, your beloved. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So we look at God's love, the revelation of God's love, because when you leave here and you go out there, you ever met people that don't like other people just because they're people? It doesn't matter what color you are. It's just because you're a person and they have an agenda that day to be nasty. You ever met somebody that's just being nasty no matter where they are? They can have the best of things and still be nasty. Why? Because they've not been born again. See, God holds the whole world. And please get this. As far as God is concerned, the whole world is a prison. And you're a prisoner. When you're not born again, you're a prisoner to sin. You're a prisoner to the slavery aspects and the actions of sin. And so he looks at the whole world and that until you get born again and come into his love, until you become as he is, one with him. Remember in the book of Isaiah, he used to talk about God does not share his, his glory with anybody, but he does now with you and I, because guess what? We're one with him. Remember Jesus prayed the high priest prayer. And he says, Father, that they be one with us. So we are one now. So now God has an obligation to share, guess what? Everything that he is with us, we are called heirs of God and join heirs with Christ Jesus. Amen. So you can't walk around having some slavery mentality now because you've been born of love. You have the love of God in you. And you should always, as I say, and I've always said, you should always, always demonstrate that love. See, you don't have to open your mouth when somebody accuses you. Well, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. No. Nobody want that piece. All right? That piece you keep to yourself and ask God to forgive you for it. That piece. You know, I watched one of my, my buddies, you know, I, I, this, this, this couple of guys that I watch on YouTube, they, 
you know, they fish. And, and so I usually watch them because they don't have all of the stuff going on that some of the other ones have. And, and so this guy, he had punched in his numbers when he left, which, which we call waypoints. He punched in his numbers, and he'd gone to a certain location, which was a, a, a broken up uh, vessel under the water. It was about 80, 90 feet under the water. And so you call these waypoints. So you hit the you hit it in your boat after you put a waypoint and you punch it in, and then guess what? Your boat will automatically go to that. All you gotta do is follow the course. And so this guy was sitting on this place fishing. He's doing his TV show. And uh, here comes this boat. Came all the way across. He's 20 some miles out in the water. And this boat comes all the way and pulls up right up next to him, to the point that you could just throw your lure over in his boat. And, uh, and the guy in the other boat told him, he says, you're in my fishing spot. And so, uh, now, again, as far as the Coast Guard and national waters or federal waters are concerned, the water doesn't belong to anyone. So wherever you are, you're there. And you can fish as much as you want unless y'all have arguments. So this guy started an argument with the guy doing the TV show. So the guy with the TV show, he got, he got, he got put, he's, he was going, he was trying to hold it back. But then after that, the guy kept saying stuff. He couldn't hold it back, man. And he said stuff, and the, and the camera was going beep, 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 beep. And so at the end of the program, he comes on and he apologizes to all of his viewers. He said, the guy really kept saying stuff, and he got to me. And he says, and you'll notice on the camera, beep, 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 he says, because he says he really got to me, and I started saying stuff back to him. You know, because I was already there. He comes from 20 some miles somewhere else and comes over where I am and claims it as his own. See, these are the things, the pressures, that let you know who you are. All right? They let you know who you are. See? The other person is who they are. <laughs> but you are who you are. It's like marriage. You guys, anybody married? Y'all know somebody, don't you? You know somebody that's not you. The Bible says that the two shall uh, be joined together and become what? What? No, 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 no. One what? One flesh. It didn't say they became one spirit. It says they became one bundle of emotional disturbance, <laughs> sometimes disappointment. That's what it says. It didn't say you became one spirit. No, 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 no. It doesn't say that. And anybody that's married know that. <laughs> that's why when I hear people say, well, they should get married, get out of sin, I was going like, getting married don't get you out of sin. That just brings two people together to make more sin. <laughs> Are y'all with me? If you're, not, if you're not born again, I can tell you right now, that's all it is, all right? So... Now, let's get away from all that because y'all minds are going way off now, all right? But the, the illustrations that God have through the word of God, they teach you and I how to walk every day and to control our, our tempers, everything about us because you are, you've been designed or perfected by love. And so love is requiring the seeds of love to be sown. This is why it's so important for you to, to be around faith minded people, people that have the minds to follow the word of God, to obey the word of God. Look at all the people in the, in the, in the book of Hebrews that just were obedient to the word of God and they became people in, the, in what we call the faith hall of fame. You've got murderers in there. You've got prostitutes in there. You've got people that ran from God in there. You've got drunkards in there. If you read it. Noah was a drunkard, <laughs> Moses was a murderer, Rahab was a prostitute. You just look at the whole list of people. There are a whole list of people, but what they did was they began to conform to the word of God and do the word of God, and because they were obedient to the word of God, guess what, God put them in there to let, let you and I know that guess what, a hero or a zero, you still have to live by faith. Amen. Are you guys with me? Amen. All right, Amen. and this is the way we have to formulate and walk in love. We perfect our love by getting in situations like that every day and welcoming those situations. All right? We teach and we've always taught that God wants you to prosper. How many of you believe that? Amen. By the word of God, we know that, all right? And guess what? Jesus said, he said this, he says, the poor will always be with you. 
You'll always have the poor. Why does he say the poor will always be with us? Because it gives you and I the opportunity to challenge poverty and put it away. He says, those that do what to the poor? Those that give to the poor, you do what? You lend to the Lord. So when we give to the poor, what we're doing is we're crushing out poverty so that God will have his word in our life and we'll be recipients of that. Instead of just thinking, well, if I give to the poor, I don't have time to give to the poor. I can tell you right now, that's the best way for you to prosper is to take care of somebody that can't take care of themselves. Is to be able to do that. That's why we always with the kids in Hades. We're always doing this. We support them for years and years. Why? Because we know that that is one of the avenues that God causes you to prosper. Amen. See? Well, the Lord said, that's why I don't give them to them. I don't give to them. Because the Lord said they'll always be here. You're missing out the point. God said that because you can start a warfare against poverty. And he's given you the opportunity to always to become rich. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Woo, let's get back to love this morning because some people are going like, oh, Pastor, I don't want to give nobody. If you don't give, you will never live. Romans chapter 8. Do y'all mind if I take my time with this part? All right? Because this is most important. I wish the whole world would hear this today. Now, I know we have people in 14 countries listen to us, listen and follow us, but there are more than 14 countries in the world. And I wish that every man and every heart would open up to this particular saying of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 8, I'm going to read this, and then we're going to go, and we're going to look at something to show you why it's so important for you to worship this person that loves you. Because when you look at God, and God looks at you, there are a lot of things that happen. And we have not, we've gotten to the name of Jesus and we understand the power of the name of Jesus. But there's something tremendous about your personal worship with Almighty God. Knowing that nothing can separate you from God's love. That's why you're looking at him. See? And I look at him because he said he'd be responsible for my life. See? It says this in chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So make sure you're in him. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So we see conditions. Are you with me? This is not this watered down grace message that people throw all over the world. That everybody can live any kind of way they want. And God is just going to be nice to them. Some people are going to wake up and it's going to be at the judgment seat. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free or made me free from the law of sin and death. Praise the Lord. We see a higher law that has come on the scene to take care of the law that has had us as slaves and in bondage for so long. Please get understanding. Without understanding, you won't get this. If you don't yield to the understanding of God, that means you have to have a, a heart that's a heart of, of kingdom activity. That's the only way you can understand this word, okay? When Jesus taught, and I've been hearing my wife teach this for the last couple of weeks, and she's been sharing this about, you know, from Mark chapter 4, about the sower sowing the word. And when the sower sows the word, it says that there are four kinds of hearts. The first heart is one of, of satanic activity. That's why Satan can come immediately. See, Satan can't come immediately if something is there to block him. And it says he came immediately and stole the word out of the heart. That's a heart that's filled with demonic activity. Don't you fool yourself, all right? The next one is a hollow heart. They just heard a little bit. They got glad for a while, and then they allowed it to slip on out because of persecution. And then he talks about that half-hearted heart, the one who's in the world, but he's wanting to be in the kingdom, but he's in the world. That's a half-hearted heart. That half-hearted heart can't get nothing done because it's a half-hearted heart. But it says the whole heart, the one that has kingdom activity, the one that's seeking after kingdom activity, it says that one will produce 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold. So you have to have understanding to get these things of God so that you can walk in more than where you are today because he died on that cross for you to have and to live a greater life than you're living today. And we have yet to walk in the things of Almighty God. 
He says this, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. And that's what you're dealing with right now. More so than the enemy because Jesus gave us his name to have power over all of the things of the enemy. You're dealing with your flesh body that has to be transformed in the resurrection. Other than that, guess what? I'm telling you right now, if you let your body tell you everything to do when somebody, somebody gets you mad, your body is going to tell you all the stuff in your body, the desires in your body, you know, the pressures in your body, the pride in your body. It's going to tell you how to respond and you're going to respond according to the flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. You see that? If you're in the flesh, that's all you think about. It's like evil people. What do they think about all the time? All they think about is is doing some evil. They dream it up. They manifest what they dream up. They practice what they dream. But that's not the way it should be with you and I. You and I should be dreaming how we're going to love somebody, how we're going to help somebody, how we're going to make somebody's life better than our own life. When you service somebody else, you're telling the Lord God, I'm asking you for favor for myself. He says to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is deep-seated hatred against God for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. For they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So I don't care how big that church is. I don't care how big that organization is. They can have all kinds of little labels on them that you only understand if you take a handshake or somebody tell you this or whatever. It doesn't matter. Let me tell you something. If it's not Jesus, it's going to fall. All right? If it's not pleasing the Spirit of God, it's going to fall. It's coming down. I don't understand how we got all these organizations. Well, I do understand from the devil's standpoint because he develops all those organizations to keep you from knowing God. He says this because the carnal mind is deep-seated hatred for it cannot be subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can it be so. Please bear with me because I'm going somewhere. You need to get this. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh because you weren't born again of the flesh. It's like, a, it's like, the, it's like the caterpillar. All right, He was born a worm, but he got born again. And he became a what? A butterfly. <laughs> Y'all got to get this now. All right? He was born a worm, but he got born again. And now being born again, he's a caterpillar. I mean, he's a butterfly. And that's, ha- that's what happened to you. You got born again. Did you not? Hold your hand up. If you're born again, hold your hand up. You got born again. You ought to always celebrate that. Because guess what? There ain't a whole lot of people in the world like you. It says this, you are not in the flesh, but of the, in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. And if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Again, we've got the favor of God. Therefore, brethren, we adept us not to the flesh, but to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. In other words, you got to bring things under control. You can't get mad because somebody said something to you or somebody's a racist or somebody's prejudiced in which they are different or somebody's this culture or somebody's that culture. Who cares about all of that? All of that comes under the kingdom of almighty God. God made us all. He will take care of that. You have more time to take care of yourself. And if you spend that time wisely, you will find out that, guess what? You should never open up your mouth or your tongue against anything unless you were saying something through the heart and the faith of love. You should never do it. Amen. It says this. Oh, boy. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Why? Because you're born of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption whereby we say, our beloved Father, Daddy God, Daddy God. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. I'm going somewhere. Y'all hold on now. The Spirit, of, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. 
I'm a child of God. Not because, you know, that I did so much good and all this, but because God loved me before, guess what? And because he loved me, guess what? Now I love him. Amen. See, because he transformed my whole life into a seed of love. See, and that seed of love expresses the kindness of God. And if, you, and if, and if children, then heirs, joint heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. So, you know, we got more favor than you think about. Amen. Can you imagine what Jesus owns? I told somebody yesterday, I said, how do you talk to the wind? Because you own it. Can you, can you imagine? Jesus talked to the wind, talked to the water. Why? Because he owns it. Can you imagine what else he owns? That's just what we saw on the earth. He owns every angel, every galaxy. He can speak to everything and it obeys him because it was made for his pleasure. Can, can you imagine the power? And it says you and I are joint heirs with him. Thank you, God. And, we, and we cry because we, we ain't got baby milk money. What am I going to do? I can tell you what you're going to do. You need to go and make a withdrawal from your joint heir account. John heirs with Christ, if it so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. For in the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. In other words, the earth is crying out, waiting for you to be who you're supposed to be. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who have subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which, are, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Now, if you don't have this drawn out in your Bible, underline it. Okay? Do you know what the first fruits are? Hmm? The first fruits of the Spirit is presence, the gifts, all of the callings, everything, the mercies of God, the revelations, if that's just the first fruit, what's the lump going to be? I mean, all the miracles and things that we've seen the Holy Spirit operating in the church, if that's just the first fruit, what's the lump going to look like? What's your life going to look like when all of this fullness come in? Even ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our bodies. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for it? It says, for, but if we hope for that which we see not, then we do with patience, we wait for it. And this is what I wanted to get to. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us with our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us, with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, from verse 1 down to 26, we've been talking about creation of sin and all these things, and now we're getting into the personal side of our life with God. The Holy Spirit and Jesus make up two-thirds of the Trinity, do they not? You have two-thirds of the Trinity praying for you. Jesus is our high priest, intercessor, and the Holy Spirit. Two-thirds of the Trinity praying for us while Daddy God is holding up his arms over us, welcoming us to victory. I'll give you an illustration of it, something that typifies this. In the book of Exodus, when they came up against the Amorites and it says that Moses held his hands up and then he got tired and guess what he had to have two other people say says, so Aaron who was who high priest forget family high priest and then it says who her not H-E-R H-U-R it says her 
held up his hand on the other side, his name means light or illumination, which represents the Holy Spirit. So there's a picture there in the Old Testament that represents God holding his hand up over us for victory and the Holy Spirit and Jesus are there holding up his hands until you and I get to the place where God want us to be. See, the Bible is filled with revelations of God's love for us. But most of the time, we want to come to church, hear a few words and get out of church because our focus is on us and not on who he is. And it says that Moses' hands stood there until Joshua, it says Joshua, it says he discomforted them. <laughs> In other words, Joshua beat everybody. It says, even during that time, it says that guess what? God threw stones out of, out of, out of heaven and took out enemies more with the stones than they took out with the sword. Can you imagine God aiming at your enemy? He never misses. Your enemy is in trouble. But only if you know. And this is what he's saying here about the Holy Spirit. Jesus has already prayed this high priestly prayer for us, over us. The Holy Spirit is now showing you, or Paul is showing you, the apostle is showing you in the spirit realm that the Holy Spirit is also one who prays over us. So we have now victory now. All right? Victory, all we need to do is to know how to come before God and allow these two that are praying for us, interceding for us. I'm going to use that word because interceding is more than just praying. Interceding for us that we might be victorious against our enemies every day because this is eternal. This is not something that's going to happen one day and then we go on. This is eternal because it's in Christ Jesus. So every day out there, when you allow the Holy Spirit to pray through you, you have already accomplished one-third of the Trinity. Jesus is already there praying for you. Now you're allowing another third of the Trinity to be in operation for you before God Almighty. So there's no way you can fail to walk in God's love if you really want to walk in God's love. Because he's demonstrating how much he loves us. He says this, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Where are you when he's doing this? You're face to face with God. When you're praying in the Spirit, no matter where you are, you are face to face with God. Because God's Spirit don't pray to God's back. You're face to face with him. When I come in here in the mornings, the Holy Spirit always tell me, son, come to the altar. You be face to face with God. When I'm in my prayer closet at home, I'm face to face with God. If I'm going down the road and I'm praying in the, in, in the spirit in the car, I'm face to face with God. Because I'm doing this now in spirit. You're face to face. Get this, please. He that searches the hearts, this is talking about daddy God, See, God's involved in this. He that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So we see daddy God is involved in this because he's right there, guess what? As typified over in the book of Exodus. See, waiting for you so that you can have victory every day in life. And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose. Now he's come back to you and I. And he says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. See, Jesus is our oldest family member. Don't you love that? Yeah. You can call him elder brother. He's our brother. He's the oldest family member in the forever family of God. The oldest. And you know what always came on the firstborn? They always had a double portion of blessing. So Jesus is going to always be filled with a double portion for you. He's got more than enough. Check this out. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. You'll notice that those verbs are in past tense. 
Past tense, that means this is already done. Huh? So what shall we say then to these things? Oh boy, here we go. Little troubled one. Huh? Little one that thinks you're lonely, nobody loves you. Hmm? Oh, well nobody's ever treated anybody in the world the way they've treated me. Really? Let's, let's check out this little troubled one. What shall we say then, or then say to these things, of these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Come on now, check it out. He says, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Say, say what? I mean, if he didn't spare him and he allowed him to go through obedience and learn so that he could become our resurrector, then guess what? Since he did all of that with Jesus, why do you think he's withholding something from you? If it's something that he has to give you, he has to give it to you because there's no limitations in Christ Jesus. Hmm. For who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justified. In other words, God as judge has already said, done, finished, not guilty, they're mine. Don't put your hands on them. Don't talk ugly to them, all right? Don't look at them like you got something to say, but you don't say it. <laughs> hmm? Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. In other words, Christ ain't going to condemn us because he died for us. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. See, this is what makes me happy. And I don't need happenings to make me happy. I'm happy because I know God loves me. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Come on now. Shall tribulation? Anybody in here ever had any tribulation? And if you haven't had any, guess what? Pack your bags. Make sure you got a good lunch because sometimes tribulation can last through lunchtime. How about distress? Anybody ever been distressed? You know, like I say, you got married, you became one flesh, but you didn't become one spirit. That's enough right there to give you some distress somewhere along the line. <laughs> you distress with him. Oh, man. Ooh. He's a man that once when you, when you cook three eggs, he won five. He's never satisfied. She's a woman that, guess what? You can fill a whole house up, and guess what? She won a bond fill, too. I mean, have you ever had some distress? There's some people that you cannot satisfy in the flesh even though you are joined to them. Y'all got real quiet. Because once they're joined to your flesh, they don't want to be your flesh. I'm not going to talk about marriage today, all right? Not even the desire to be married. It says this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? How about persecutions? God bless you with that job and somebody's on there talking about you that used to be down the line with you talking about the boss. But you wouldn't talk about the boss. You're just saying, the Lord, this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. And after a while, guess what? A promotion came to you that they gave you a position. They gave you an office. They gave you a spot up there that you don't even have a resume for. And now that person that used to be your friend has become your silent enemy. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> How about famine? Anybody ever been hungry? Come on now, talk to me. If you haven't been hungry, guess what? One day's coming that you will be. Okay? It's going to happen either spiritually or physically. It's going to happen. Okay, because the Holy Spirit is writing these things to let you know that those particular things that you might enter into, they may happen, but the love of God is greater than these things. How about nakedness? Don't have enough to wear. I, I've met people that when I first met them, you know, I, in fact, I met a young man when we were building this, this building here. We didn't even have the parking lot paved, and he pulled in one day, and he pulled over there, and he got out of his old rusty car, 
and he talked to me and he said some things and he told me who he was, you know, and all this. And I said, oh, that's fine. I said, do you go to church? Well, I don't go to church because I don't have no clothes. I said, really? Is that your only excuse? You know what I did? I took him downtown. Anybody ever been to Tim's Mart? It's not there anymore. All of you guys around here somewhere, y'all done shopped at Tim's Mart one time or the other. I took him down to Tim's Mart and I told Tim, I said, Tim, hook him up, give him a suit, give him a pair of shoes, give him everything he need to look right. And I paid for it all right there on the spot. And I told him, I said, now what's your excuse now? Just because you have clothes, don't have clothes? You know, they stripped Jesus naked on the cross. He wasn't laying there with something like a diaper on him. They stripped him naked because they wanted to humiliate him as a criminal. All right? And so all of those things bear witness to you and I how our life should be filled now because he emptied himself so that you and I could have more than enough. So don't mind your wife shopping. All right? Mine went shopping the other day. I got tired of walking and I sit in the car. I said, go do what you got to do, girl. I said, I ain't going to. I'm not, I'm not going to keep on walking like that. Just go do what you got to do. Have, your, have yourself a good old time. And she kept on till she got tired. She figured out why I was sitting down, you know? <laughs> Just said, go right on. Help yourself. He says this, how about pearl or the sword? Have you ever been threatened? I'm glad I had a mother that used to pray for me when I was in high school because I wasn't living the best that I should have been living. And I remember a night we won a football game down in Charles City. And we beat them like 56 to nothing. And we came back in the locker room. We was laughing. Guys was talking. I mean, everybody was scoring touchdowns that night. It was like eating a bowl of soup. It was something for everybody, you know? And these guys must have had bet on the game or something because, you know, I don't know. But when we got back to the locker room, we were in the locker room, and I was standing at the door like this. The coaches were standing there, and everybody was celebrating, man. We was having a good time, guys, you know. And, and, and somebody opened the door up. When they opened the door, the guy held a gun right in my face. Just like that, right like, just like this. And I looked right down the barrel of that thing, you know? And I was going like, oh my Lord, is this the last game I'm gonna play? You know, <laughs> you know? And that guy, it was two of them. And they walked in and cussed the coaches out, cussed everybody out in the place, you know? And then guess what, reached up and cut the light off. When they cut the light off, I knew somebody was gonna get shot. See, I was a teenager. You know, and you get threatened with a gun in your face like that, what are you thinking? You know, you ain't thinking, Jesus. No, <laughs> you ain't thinking that. You're thinking salvation. When they cut that light off, I hit the floor. Because I just figured somebody's going to get shot. Because these guys were ticked off. I don't know how much money they lost or what. You know, maybe it was some form of pride they lost. I don't know. You know, but I know when somebody holds a gun in your face, you ain't thinking about all the other stuff in life. You're thinking about that moment. All right? Anybody ever held a gun in your face? That's right. See? We've got a witness. You know, somebody hold a gun on you, threaten you with a knife or something? Let me tell you something. It's time to already know Jesus. All right? It's not time to call on him and say, Lord, Lord, will you come? It's time to already know him. Are y'all with me? I'm going to let y'all go get y'all hot dogs and all that stuff in a moment. But I'm trying to help you today because you need to know the love of God. He says this. All right, this is my first closing. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter, but we're not slaughtered because we have resurrection life. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that love us. This more than conquer, it, it represents more than one word. All right, in the Aramaic, it represents more than one word. It says you are unrivaled. You are equipped, empowered, unrivaled for any foe to come against you. All right? Unrivaled. So every day when you go out on the street and no matter how tired you are, what you got to do, working or whatever, just understand when an enemy comes up, just look at him and say, do you really want a part of this? You want some of me? Because <laughs> you, you have more than that. See, you have to be bold with the kingdom of God in your life. You can't be some weak person walking around telling me, don't you want to be a Christian just like me? No. Don't you want to be a king like me? A king? That means something. You know, but just like you? Then Paul says this, I am persuaded that neither death, death can't separate us because death is just an open door for you and I. 
Our bodies become a seed. Our spirit and our soulless man goes to the Lord. Our body becomes a seed. It goes in the ground. And then guess what? In the resurrection, you know how a piece of corn is? A bean? An acorn? You know how it is when you put it in the ground? When it comes up, it's so much more. All right? And so our body is going to become so much more through the resurrection. See? See, you got to know that. So you should never be afraid of death because death can't separate you from God. We're going to the Lord. Everything that I'm saying, everything that I'm thinking, it's going to the Lord. But guess what? This old body one day, it's going to lay down, you know, somewhere, and the worm's going to eat it up. And guess what? It's going to go back to the dust somewhere, whatever, whether it's in the ocean, whether it's in a, in a funeral thing, burn, whatever. Wherever this body goes, guess what? Because the gene, oh, God, y'all got to get this. Because the gene that lives inside of this dust, God's going to call it. Just like the gene that lives inside of the corn. When it's put in the ground, because of the gene that's in it, it has to come up corn. See? And so our bodies, because we have Jesus living in us, the gene of, of the king living in us, we have to come up as a king. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life no angels or principalities, no power, no things present, no things to come, no height. Y'all need to read this sometimes. No height, no depth, no any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. How could Paul say this? He went through so many things. But you have to understand, he was taught as a Pharisee of Pharisees. In other words, he was educated in the Torah. And in, the old, in all of the old books, whether minor or major prophets, he was educated. And he knew something about Jesus and about you and I before God. So what I'm going to do is, this is in the book of Songs. All right? Some people call it the Song of, of Solomon. Some people call it the Song of Songs. All right? This is my second closing. I'm going to read you something that's most important, why you should worship the Lord. Even when you are praying and you have problems, persecutions, whatever these things are, you still come before the Lord and you worship him with your problems, with your rejections. This is why I know people can get self-delivered with your, with your, your inability to, to get where you want in life. Be like Jonah. Pray while you're dying so that God can accelerate your destiny. <laughs> Woo. Three days journey became one. In Psalms 4, I'm on my closing now. Don't y'all shout me down, because I ain't going nowhere until I close. There are many different translations for this. I got an old one. This is what it says in Psalm. In Psalms 4 9. This is about the Lord and his bride. That's us. That's all of us that's been taken into his love. When you got married, you took somebody into your love, right? Okay, okay. It says this For you reach into my heart. With one flash of your eyes, I am undone by your love. I know it's not in your translations. That's why I'm reading it out of mine. <laughs> uh, see? All y'all just looking, y'all looking, y'all going through all your smartphone stuff. Your smartphone ain't got this. <laughs> Again, this is the Lord and his bride. This is you who've been born in love, all right? He says this, 
For you reach into my heart. With one flash of your eyes, I am undone by your love. This is the Lord talking to you. When you reach into his heart, one flash of your eyes calls him to be undone. This is how much he loves you and how much he knows his bride's going to love him. He says, for you reach into my heart with one flash of your eyes, I am undone by your love, my beloved, my equal, my bride. You leave me breathless. I am overcome by merely a glance from your worshiping eye. For you have stolen my heart. Praise God. I am held hostage by your love and by the graces of righteousness shining upon you. God says, You have stolen my heart with your worshiping eyes. See, when you come to church and you worship the Lord and you look to Him face to face, He's looking in your eyes just like you're looking toward him. And he's saying, because you love him so much, you steal his heart. Now, if you steal his heart, don't you think he'll take care of you? <laughs> if you steal his heart, don't you think that he will get involved in whatever you're going through and bring you out victorious? All things are working together for your good. If, he, if, you, if he's looking in your heart and he's looking at you and you're looking at him and he's telling you, you stole my life, you stole my love, I can't do nothing because you got me. Isn't that what true love is all about? You got me. That's why my wife jumped over those boxes many years ago. <laughs> In chapter 6, it says this. This is my close. And don't you guys come up here asking me, what translation was that? Did you use that? Because huh? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> He says this in chapter 6, same book, same song. All these things was written before Solomon went crazy. Chapter 6, verse 5, he says this. He's talking to his bride. He says, turn your eyes from me. I can't take it anymore. Oh, y'all, y'all ain't y'all ain't with me. Katira, as your husband told you, turn your eyes away from me. Because I can't take it no more. Huh? <laughs> Woo. Jesus says, turn your eyes away from me. I can't take it. <laughs> Ooh, some of you never read this book, do you? He says, turn your eyes from me. I can't take it. Nate? Today? Today did Nate say, turn your eyes away from me. I can't take it. <laughs> no, no. This, see, see, this is Jesus long before he went to the cross. And he's telling you and I, how much he loves us. He says, turn your eyes away from me. I can't take it anymore. I can't resist the passion of these eyes that I adore. Overpowered by a glance, my ravished heart is undone. Held captive by your love, I am truly overcome. For your undying devotion to me is the most yielded sacrifice. God is saying when you love him, when you worship him, his love to you is that you have conquered the conqueror. Can you imagine? Your love conquers Jesus. You have conquered the conqueror of all things 
And this is why Paul said, we are more than conquerors. Your love, when you come in these doors or when you're at home, it conquers Jesus. It makes him come on the scene and make all things work together for your good. Now, I know some people, you know, they're going to, well, you know, I don't need all that. Oh, yeah, you need it in this day. Every time you go to the gas pump, you need some conquering power. <laughs> you go to the grocery store, you can't find what you used to find. On the news, you hear all that stuff going on. Oh, you need some conquering power. You need to go before the Lord and say, Lord, the word says, and it can't be a no, that when you look into my eyes, my love for you ravishes you so much that you can't handle it. I know you're going to work this out for me. That's love. Because you know now a revelation of how much God loves you. I'm going to leave you with that today because y'all sitting here looking like y'all going into Wonderland. Wonderland. You don't need to be in Wonderland. You need to be in real land. See, the realness of this is that God loves you so much that he wrote about his love for you before you even got his love. See? And this is what Paul is writing about, being a Pharisee of Pharisees. He understood this. That's why he was saying the things that he said in short form. He understood the love of God. Nothing can separate you. Whatever they hurt you with can't separate you from God's love. Whatever they're trying to do, it can't separate you from God's love. Just remember these two particulars and then look them up in as many translations as you can because I know you're going to try. <laughs> Search your heart. Amen. <laughs> Until you find. But God loves you. And you need to demonstrate that today instead of being frustrated with what's going on around you. If you think prices are something now, what do you think is going to happen when the tribulation hit? Hmm? You won't be here. You won't know anything about it, I pray. But what do you think is going to happen to people that displayed God? The half-hearted, the hollow-hearted, or those who just had demonic activity all the time and they just thought that they were their own gods? And I say to you out there that's watching this, when you get a revelation of how much God loves you, you're going to change your attitude about how you handle people, how you speak to people, how you accuse people with a slanderous tongue. You're going to remember some things about what you should do because if it's not a faith, it's sin anyway. All right? So I pray that today's message, I didn't hoop and holler. I just wanted to make some sense to you today because today common sense is not common. Years ago, people had common sense. but They don't have it today. And it's because, guess what? All the things of the world are passing away. And the benefit of those who will walk by the Spirit of God is coming on the earth. And so, as I said in the beginning, please give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Without the Lord being Savior, Lord, owner, Savior, life giver. Without him being Lord and Savior in your life, uh, there's no hope for you. I'm just telling you straight as it is. But with him is life forevermore. So we pray that you study what I shared with you guys today. Study and make it a part of your understanding so that you can trust the Lord God if you're a believer. If you're not a believer, please accept him. Accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Uh, thank you for your time today. Uh, busy time. I know it's 4th of July and everybody's got the fireworks and whatever, but let this fire be the first work that take place in your life. Amen. That's a work of the Lord Jesus Christ, an inside job. Amen? Amen? And please contact us and let us know how the miraculous power of God is working in your life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day. This is God's design. Now, for